Hi, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and Podcast. I am absolutely thrilled to have a very special guest today, Dr. Anna Kabeka. Anna is an expert in women's health and functional medicine. She's also triple board certified and a fellow of gynecology and obstetrics, as well as integrative medicine, anti-aging and regenerative medicine. So she can help every age group, uh, but especially with women's health issues. She holds special certifications in functional medicine, sexual health, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And she's also a best-selling author of multiple books. Uh, she's appeared on ABC, NBC, all the major networks, um, and has been featured in numerous online print publications. Uh, she also lives in Dallas with her daughters, horses, and dogs. So Anna, thank you so much for being here. It is great to be here with you, Adrian. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm, I'm so excited for this interview in particular because I'm pregnant and the time is getting closer and closer to when I'm going to have to think about the actual birth. Um, I've sort of been blocking it out, <laughs> but you know, it's such an amazing nine months and the last, you know, six and a half for me, uh, many people have spoken to me about uh, their fertility issues and their pregnancies and their births. And obviously I'm researching myself, what I want mine to be like, what can they be like, what should I be worried about, all these things. Um, so I've been wanting to have a conversation with, uh, you know, sort of more functional OBGYN. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people have also spoken to me about perimenopause or going into early menopause and what, you know, that experience is like if it was kind of, you know, very early and they were still thinking about having children and things like that. So there's a way that that's linked to fertility as well. And I know that's a big focus for you. So we'll, we'll dive into all of that, but first let's start with kind of the, I shouldn't even say the beginning because it starts way before this, but let's just say, <laughs> let's start with fertility as the beginning of some sort of, you know, pregnancy journey in your experience, what have you seen to be the most common root causes of infertility? You know, if someone's trying to conceive what are really the most important things she and her partner can do naturally to support fertility? Yeah, that, you know, and like you said, it starts way before thinking about becoming pregnant when we really have to start optimizing our fertility. And I, one thing is, is really optimizing your periods, you know, starting with optimizing your period. So if you've been on birth control, you really don't know your period. So getting to know your natural cycle off birth control, off any hormones, it's really important. And if you're having PMS symptoms, if you have irregular bleeding or spotting, that's a sign that we've got to, we've got to get our body, our hormones in sync, our uterus in sync with our hormones and our ovaries and everything kind of just synchronize it. And the birth control pill for a couple months can kind of reset. But again, when we're on it long term, that can kind of disrupt our own connection with our natural hormonal flow. And when I see women that are struggling with PMS and irregular cycles or painful periods, that's like, that's a big red flag. And I want to address that right away, very holistically, naturally through diet and lifestyle, and maybe some supplements that we'll use just to kind of really balance things out once we understand what's going on. So I think that's really first and foremost, getting in touch with a second really big cause of infertility is, is male factor. We're seeing over 40% of infertility is because of, you know, inadequate sperm production, motility issues with sperm, something related to the male, fa male factor. So we can address that too. And then um, ovarian resistance, just aging uh, can be a a problem. And one, one thing we call a luteal phase defect it means a shorter than optimal second half of your cycle post ovulation. So if there, if that's shorter, um, or we don't have enough progesterone, it's harder to maintain an implanted fertilized egg. So that can be an issue too. And then I'm going to throw in stress. Stress is a huge infertility factor for sure, both male and female. So I was just going to say, I've heard a few of the ones you mentioned and stress was definitely a part of that. Can you explain just, I know how complicated it is, but as you know, a quick, simple explanation, if there is one of like how exactly stress impacts, because I know 
you know, cortisol is a stress hormone and there's a lot of hormonal things going on to get pregnant. So I assume it's in there, but would you mind elaborating on that a little bit? Yeah. And I, and I know this firsthand from my own experience. So when I was 39, you know, and I'd been an OBGYN for over a decade at that point, oh my gosh, more than a decade. And I was diagnosed with early infertility and early menopause. I failed the highest doses of infertility treatments and was told I would never be able to have another child. And that was, you know, just I was grief stricken with that information. Here I'd help thousands of women, couples conceive healthy pregnancies. You know, I did fertility treatments. I was specialist solo OBGYN. So I took care of the needs of my patients. It was just one of those things that really had devastated me. And it took me on a journey around the world for a healing. And that's one of the reasons why there's many different tools in my doctor's bag than many of my colleagues. And it was this firsthand experience. But for me, that reason, looking back, because I didn't know at the time, we're not taught this in med school and even OBGYN residency. We're like, oh yeah, there's stress issues, you know, get a massage, whatever, but really what's happening. And for me, it was an early infertility, right? Early menopause, you know, it was just, it blew my mind. And what happens is when we are stressed, I had post-traumatic stress. We had a tragedy, a major tragedy in our family. And it was, um, you know, and from that, just that chronic fear, chronic stress is something else going to happen, right? That just, we've lived through a pandemic. We think, oh my gosh, there's chronic everyday stress. So whether it was a traumatic stress or chronic everyday stress, what happens is cortisol keeps getting pumped out, keeps getting pumped out. And when cortisol goes up, cortisol is manufactured from one of our key reproductive hormones or mother hormone called progesterone. So consider progesterone, progestation, you know, it, it, it is to support fertility. It, progesterone is predominant in the second half of our a menstrual cycle post ovulation. So it's kind of the hormone that makes the bed essentially in the uterus for the embryo to implant. So that's proge progesterone. And cortisol is made from progesterone, downstream from progesterone. So when we're having to make cortisol, progesterone goes down. And with that, all the other hormones that are downstream from there, and that includes estrogen. DHEA and testosterone are reproductive hormones, are hormones of sexual desire, are hormones of fertility, are hormones, you know, of pregnancy. So all of those get depleted to sacrifice to make this life-saving hormone cortisol. But when cortisol is going on for too long, you get this significant depletion. And, and in my case, it became infertility. So I would say, and I teach this and I've taught residents and other physicians around the world, but the eyes don't see what the mind don't know, right? So once I knew this, wow, I could see it. I could see it everywhere. And so part of my practice has been optimizing these major hormones so that, you know, menstrual cycles go normal again and fertility improve. We've had clients in menopause who started their periods again. And that was the case for me. I became pregnant naturally at 41 after failing hormonal therapies and hormonal treatment. So reversed menopause for another decade. I write about it in my book, The Hormone Fix, and I really do recommend the stress chapter, which is chapter eight it's for everyone, because we all have stress, but understanding how your body responds and how that manifests in our social interactions and in our interpersonal react interactions, our relationships, our energy. It's really powerful, powerful information. I want to back up and say, I normally start interviews asking people how they kind of became, you know, con if you're conventionally trained, how you became interested in the functional holistic world. This is one of the few I've ever done where that wasn't the first question. So I'm so glad that you mentioned this personal experience you had, because I think like almost everybody on who's been on the show, um, who's an expert and conventionally trained the, the way that you were, you had something happen and your eyes were open and it's usually related to personal or family something. And then you went and got this additional training and in, in functional medicine, this, this other way of looking at your body and healing. And so I appreciate you sharing that so much. And also I'm very sorry to hear about whatever the, you know, traumatic event was that, that launched the PTSD. But I know that there's women, like you said, whether it's, it's a traumatic acute event 
or this just long time chronic stress where they've been on autopilot in a stressful mode for so long that they don't even realize. I think you said your eyes can't see what your mind don't know. Like they don't even realize that there's another way of living that mm-hmm. isn't producing this much cortisol every day. Yeah. Uh, but I was so happy you also explained the mechanics of how cortisol and progesterone and fertility interact because it's so clear now. Once you explain it, it's like, duh, of course, if it's spiking too much and I'm not making enough progesterone, then how could I get pregnant? So I love all of that. Thank you. I remember when I asked my OBGYN several years before I got pregnant, I saw these, you know, ads for these pregnancy testing, you know, like these direct to consumer, really beautifully packaged tests, like find out about your fertility. And I asked her, should I, should I do one of those? Is there a test you could give me? I'm curious, you know, what's my fertility? And she said, do you get regular periods? (laughs) I said, yes. And she said, okay, well, that's about as good as we need it to, you know, there are definitely cases of women getting pregnant without a regular period or who have a regular period and still can't. But overall, it seems that that's the best way to, you know, understand your fertility and optimize it is, is optimizing that process first. Yeah, that's so true. And I think that with like that understanding your period, getting to know your period, knowing when you ovulate, knowing your cervical mucus, how you can tell the the changes to your cervical mu- mucus to show that you have ovulated, you won't see that on the birth control pill. So you've really got to get off the birth control pill to optimize, to really get in touch with that. I could spend an entire interview talking with you about the birth control pill and how much I don't support it. And, you know, I had experiences with um, amenorrhea in college where I didn't get my period for, I think it was two or three years. And it was very unusual and strange. And I, you know, this really was one of the three major events in my life that got me interested in what I, when, what we're doing now and, you know, healing the body holistically and understanding root causes. And it was recommended to me by almost every OBGYN or endocrinologist I saw that I, that I take the birth control pill. And I'm so glad I listened to my intuition to say, that's going to cover it up. Like I want to understand what's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. And luckily I did. I ended up working with more of a holistic nutritionist who helped me in a variety of ways with herbs and and acupuncture and supplements and and diet change. And I was able to restore it um, after six months of working with her. And it's been completely normal as far as coming, you know, around every 30 days, um, lasting about six days since I was 20. But I have so many friends who were on the birth control for a very long time and then only went off to get pregnant only to discover under the hood, these other issues. And and then it took a very long time to get pregnant or it was a very expensive journey, similar to yours, where they had to then quickly switch into, you know, synthetic hormone or IVF mode or something like that. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that leads me to my next question for you, which is. I've had a lot of questions from the Wellbe community about freezing eggs and IVF and feeling like they know these hormones are synthetic and they don't really want them in their body, um, but they're also at a certain age or having certain issues where they feel like they have no choice but to do that. Um, and they're asking me, is there a natural way to do egg freezing or IVF or are there long-term hormonal implications or impacts uh, to doing that? You know, either the egg freezing or IVF, which seems to be about the same process um, and just, you know, wanting to know if there's anything they can do to make it more natural or should they avoid it. And I really don't know enough about this topic in that area. So I thought you would be a great source of information. Yeah. On you know, and I've counseled many women too, but like, I don't know, you know, if I am going to be able to, or when we're going to have babies. And I feel like this is, I'm drawn to freezing my eggs. And I think that's, that it's definitely a personal decision and it's a quick, I mean, it's a quick process and, and it's hormonal health for a couple months, right? But your body will recover from that. So I would say prepare your body as, as, you know, prepare your body as much as possible beforehand. So like optimizing your diet and nutrition for me, it's all about getting like a very healthy keto green diet. And that's something I write about in my books, the keto green diet. So breaking up with sugar, intermittent fasting, no snacking, hydrating between meals, not with meals. I mean, these are key principles, diet and lifestyles to manage our major hormones. And that will really help your cycle and, you know, supplement as needed, you know, fish oils, make sure your vitamin D iodine levels 
are all healthy, thyroid's healthy, but for reasons like, you know, concerns for cancer, delayed childbearing, freezing eggs is a viable option. And it's also, you know, it's a safety net. You don't have to use, use them. It's, you know, it's, a uh, different feeling than if you have, you know, frozen embryos, right? But with frozen eggs, you have that, you have that ability and um, hormonally, you know, the process to increase the number of eggs that are formed during that time. So the extra hormones that we're injecting essentially to help, help you do that, it's, you know, they do, they flush out of your system you know, by the next menstrual cycle. And then again, keeping up with additional detoxifying herbs and supplements will help you clear that and regain your healthy period. Anyway, so if you're freezing eggs because family history of cancer, you know, concern for delayed childbearing, whatever your personal reasons are, you can feel rest assured that, you know, you're, as long as you're focusing on healthy diet, nutrition, lifestyle, using herbs and supplements to help detox the hormones after the fact, you're going to do great. You're going to do great. And that's a kind of a peace of mind process for many women um, as they're, you know, wanting to delay childbearing into their late 40s, 50s. And uh, well, I don't know about 50s, but I do have one 49 year old with twins right now. And so, um, so anyway, so we have Janet uh, Jackson, remember, she was 51, I think when she had a baby. Oh, oh my gosh, right? It's, you know, 41 was that was my upper limit for sure. So I have another friend 45 with twins and IVF, you know, had done um, um, in vitro fertilization and, and sperm donation and a single single mom in New York City at 45 uh, pregnant with twins. She had seven cycles, seven rounds of failed IVF. Then I started working with her. She worked with me and an acupuncturist. Her last three embryos, her last three, you know, and failed seven rounds. So her eighth round, she conceived two um, she conceived twins, two healthy baby boys now. So living in New York City, they're three years old. Um, so, I mean, that's like the difference when we're able to optimize our body, we can remove statistic wise, you know, the chance of those three taking when the, for the healthiest and best, you know, did not, but they are, they're perfect, just perfect, right? Just perfect. Wow. So preparing beautiful. your body for IVF too, you know, whatever your personal decisions are. And I always tell clients, like what you did, listen to your intuition, that small voice inside of you. What are you visualizing? What's in your future? What are you visualizing? What do you want for yourself? Trust your intuition, pray about it fast for three days and pray. So you can be really clear in this decision making process, because it is a commitment. I love that you mentioned um, fasting and praying, because I just did I did an interview on, on circadian and intermittent fasting. And then I just did a um, investigative guide that was also a podcast episode all about the science and research behind prayer and spirituality and what does exist on it. The short answer is not that much, but um, what's out there is just fascinating and, and how it plays such a role in healing anything, whether that's infertility or uh, you know cancer or other kinds of chronic diseases. So I'm glad you mentioned that as well. So it sounds like talking about IVF and egg freezing that it's not so much that women could find a more natural version of a synthetic hormone. Like a synthetic hormone is just synthetic, right? It's not natural, but rather that they can do a lot to support their hormones with their diet and lifestyle such that they won't need as many rounds or that what they want to happen will happen and that they can use herbs and supplements to then detox out these synthetic hormones and any lingering effects they might have after they don't, you know, need them anymore or, or to sort of rebalance. So does that, is that sort of accurate? Yeah, absolutely. Because the goal is to get a number of viable options, right? A number of viable eggs and with, you know, natural estrogen and progesterone and the modalities that we have today, the, you know, we could maybe get two or three, but, you know, really want to harvest at least eight, you know, eight to 10, because it just over time, you know, some just don't, don't make it. So that's right. the, it's an invasive procedure. It's a commitment. So considering, considering that, but being as healthy as possible, you know, when, right. you're, when you're going into it to begin with. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so you mentioned actually in your description of what the woman who was in New York City 
uh, did with you and also with an acupuncturist, switching gears a little bit, when people actually are able to then conceive, whether that's, you know, through IVF or naturally, how can women navigate having as natural a pregnancy as possible? Because now that I'm going through it, I am doing a lot for myself uh, on the natural side, but I'm also seeing with my interactions with the healthcare system, all these opportunities to do things that are not as natural throughout the pregnancy. And many OBGYNs who mention almost nothing about what you're supposed to be doing for your body besides, you know, maybe limiting high mercury fish and uh, soft cheeses and and things like that. But, you know, other than that, really nothing, uh, which shocked me. I thought I was going to get you know, a packet of things that I should be eating and not eating and potential supplements and, you know, things to be doing all day and really, you know, sunscreens mm-hmm. that I couldn't have and all this stuff. And really, no, it's just, it's up to your own kind of research and there's many different sources. So that was very eye opening for me, but how can women uh, have as natural a pregnancy as possible? And are there certain, you know, treatments or modalities that you think really support a uh, natural pregnancy, like a acupuncture or chiropractic care or something like that? Yeah, definitely. I have so much to say on this topic, right? So I've had four pregnancies in my life, right? I've delivered four big babies. And, um, you know, it's been an entire journey for me. And there's so much that I want to tell women as an OBGYN going into labor and delivery. I mean, just but in pregnancy, I had handouts and I created this little booklet that I would give my patient for each, each trimester, as you go through it, or each month, as you're going through the pregnancy, there's different stages that I really want you to know. So I would try to hit on just the, like the top five, try to think of what my top five would be for, for patients. The first one that is always, you know, you want to maintain your nutrition and you want to avoid sugar. So, you know, get eating keto green lifestyle, good quality fats, healthy proteins, free range, grass fed, no pesticides, no herbicides, organic, healthy fish, you know, things that you love and enjoy is important, but no sugar, like really avoiding sugar and dairy. Like, you know, I mean, dairy is not good for us. It's not good for our babies in utero. There's lots of hormones in dairy and we really want to rely on our own hormones too. So I'm big anti-dairy, especially for PCOSers and infertility and weight loss resistance and all that stuff. So none of my book, all my recipes are dairy free. There's always an option for some good, healthy, you know, feta cheese or something, but, but for the most part, it's no dairy. I was just going to say, I try to avoid dairy myself for not any particular reason, other than like you said, you know, it's, it's a different mammal and a lot of bad hormones and things end up in dairy, even organic grass fed dairy, you know, here and there, but feta cheese is, is a, uh, (laughs) it slips into some salads and things like that here and there. Oh yeah. Yeah. I hear you on that one. So that like eating healthy and, and working with clients, diabetes in pregnancy, keto green living is very, very healthy. That nutrition, like say, for example, um, you smoke salmon with capers on a bed of greens, um, or sauteed spinach drizzled with olive oil and lemon juice for breakfast. Right. And for dinner, sauteed um, chicken with broccoli, cauliflower, some sliced carrots with olive oil, lemon juice. And, you know, just, I mean, that's like a good keto green. I mean, those are healthy keto green meals and you're avoiding the bread. You're avoiding the grains, including rice and starch. Listen to your body in pregnancy. But when we give ourselves those starches, our blood sugar is really kind of sensitive. So we get these highs and lows and we really want to keep our blood sugar really stable in, in pregnancy as much as possible so that we have a, a healthy baby who's metabolically strong and ready. Cause we know you know, insulin resistance, diabetes creates already a metabolically challenged baby. And we don't want that. And again, I wish I knew in my first couple of pregnancies, what I learned along the road, you know, I'll say God has um, humbled me by teaching me life lessons outside of the textbooks. So that is, is really that diet and nutrition. I also supplement my clients with a very good high quality multivitamin and mineral. And there's a few different ones out there. There's a couple companies that I use typically for myself or my patients products and some that I've created, but a good multivitamin with methylated B vitamins. And that's 
um, important, plus a healthy, clean omega-3 fish oil, not your Costco omega-3 fish oil, one that's heavy metal tested and clean. And another supplement that's really good for brain development and good studies on this conditionally essential amino acid is carnitine. And again, a clean source of carnitine. So I supplemented in my last two pregnancies with carnitine as I got more into research and understanding supplementation. Of course, we want our vitamin D high and healthy. So we want to optimize that as much as possible. And, you know, natural iodine rich food, which is essential for every hormone receptor. So like if we're not eating raw fish because we're pregnant and that we worry about that, but the nori leaves, the seaweed salads, things like that are very, very good for our thyroid. It's like, you know, we don't have Hashimoto's or thyroiditis or something like that. So cleaning that up, that's, that's number one with, you know, careful supplementation as number two. And the third is do your pelvic floor exercises, do your Kegel exercises for, I was telling my clients their pregnancy. Okay. This is how you do your pelvic floor exercise. I've got a video now on my YouTube channel, but you know, do your pelvic floor exercises, do it regularly. And you will do these until you die because mental health is so important. So pelvic floor exercises and pelvic massage because the perineum is so, so the, you know, mouth of the vagina, we call this a of course, I have this right near me all, all the time, but like the muscles around the vagina that are just so flexible and dynamic and they're able, our, our uterus is able to expand to, you know, carry, uh, you know, up to, you know, more than a 12 pound baby, right? With twins, sometimes there's been, you know, 16, 18 pounds in there. So the uterus is so able to expand as well as the muscles and perineum. We want to keep that tissue and blood supply healthy and healthy muscle increases healthy nerves and healthy blood vessels. So then your recovery postpartum is a lot better. So the pelvic floor exercises are important. And with that exercising during your pregnancy, for me, yoga made a huge difference in being able to deliver natural childbirth. So doing yoga and, you know, the position malasana and really getting your flexibility optimized and just strong core muscle strength because your abdomen is being stressed out, stretched out. So being able to do that you know, pelvic floor exercises and good flexibility exercises, core muscle exercises during pregnancy is essential for a healthy pregnancy and, and, and childbirth and beyond. And with that, understanding your, you know, what you want your birthing experience to be like, to really have a good visualization of what that birthing experience is. And so for me and my first child, I was like, yeah, I don't want an appease. You know, I'd been an OB for not even a year at that point and, or just over a year and, you know, had delivered many babies, but I didn't want an episiotomy, but this first child was over eight pounds and I had an anterior rip tear that teared around the urethra and up towards the clitoris. So, you know, that hurt for over a year. That was terrible. As an OB, I then gave downward pressure in my deliveries. The, the OB that delivered me just let the child come out, but downward pressure, a posterior tear or rip is much better than anterior but also a small episiotomy is much better than any tear. So really understanding like with your OB downward pressure, if you need to make an episiotomy, we really want that downward pressure and controlled downward delivery of the head, you know, makes all the difference in the world. I never, I never delivered a baby who had a anterior tear. So for sure, like that makes a difference in my practice delivered over 500 babies. And I've never delivered one with an anterior tear. Let me tell you, experience is a great teacher. And so that's really a very powerful birthing experience. And do you want to walk? How long do you want to walk? And really communicate your what you want your birthing experience to be, having a birthing advocate in for you. Because many people right now, because OBs, I mean, are busy. They're scheduled for an induction and scheduled for a cesarean section. And you don't have the birthing experience. You need that because oxytocin is essential for child attachment for you know the you know the entire process if we 
um, have to have a scheduled C-section, okay, but we really want to do everything to increase oxytocin. So nipple stimulation, that's a really important physiologic experience that moms and babies need to have for bonding. So this whole childbirth experience from episiotomy or no episiotomy, being able to walk and labor and not have your water broken until, because once the water is broken, it is painful. I know this personally and from many, many, many deliveries, but it is really painful. So delaying that um, breaking of your water until it, it breaks on its own or it's absolutely necessary to move to move labor along. And, and trusting, you know, trusting the process of your body's own natural wisdom when it comes to delivering your baby, you know, and not being uh, feared into an early induction or cesarean section don't have to. And we watch very, very closely as OBs, but really communicating that and choosing an OB who has, you know, maybe the lowest C-section rate in your community would be an optimal choice. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because my next question for you is, you know, how can women, especially with their first babies and first births like me, um, sniff out some of these myths or, or red flags that uh, might indicate that an OBGYN is not going to really be catering to the exact needs of desire or desires that a pregnant woman might have, or is going to kind of just do a lot of the standard of care stuff without thinking about whether it's all totally necessary and things like that. Because when I was choosing, a, a, whether it was a doctor or a midwife in the beginning, it was very hard to find any information about a particular OBGYN C-section rate, for example, or even a hospital C-section rate. I mean, it's really not advertised. And I knew I was in the right place with this boutique uh, midwife practice I ended up going with, um, but I'm delivering at a hospital, but they work, you know, in the hospital. Um, when it was like right on their website, you know, this is our C-section rate. This is the state of Connecticut C-section rate. This is kind of how we like to do things. And it was all about empowering the mother and it felt very different. So I just, you know, a couple of things like that. I mean, I, I have limited experience, but from your perspective, how can women really sniff out somebody who's going to be more natural and more empowering to them um, in this process and, and prevent you know, a C-section and things like that, if they can. Yeah, definitely word of mouth, like who, you know, talking to other moms, you know, that have recently had a baby and just really what were they, what was their experience? And also, you know, as an OBGYN, I know that like, I will say OB obstetrics is 95% joy, 5% sheer terror, even with the best plans. Right. But, but that's a, you know, a small fraction and we're ready for it. But I think knowing you know, healthy pregnancy, you're on board, your partner's there with you, you've got a plan, you have visualization of what that looks like, you're fit, you're healthy, you're, you know, and all of that kind of falls into place and knowing what you want your experience to be like through, you know, reading books, talking with others, and really finding that out and, and just saying sometimes in some areas, I know there's you know, there's not much, there's not much of a choice. So doing as much as, as you can on your own and being very clear about, you know, what you, what your, what your comfort level is and what you want to experience with this is important that you're able to advocate that. And some people will get, you know, a doula to help them in the labor and delivery room. And, and that is great to have, a, you know, that kind of firsthand experienced coach uh, to be there with you and to advocate with you. Cause when you're in the midst of it, you know, it's like, just, you know, let's get this over with. So um, at least I've experienced that. And we don't know, I think just really having a good connection, but a lot of times our OB practices, you know, are very, very big. And you may not even see the doctor more than once that ends up delivering you. So you're being able, you know, to have an advocate in with you in the labor and delivery room and, and knowing what you want it to look like to walk as much as possible before you go in, you know, to make sure that you're, you're able to, to squat or have a squat bar. If they have that, um, they have a labor, labor ball to sit on, you know, do you, do they allow that in their delivery room? Will they do, do the delivery in dim lights? I'm like, we don't need bright lights to do a natural delivery. And we don't need this bright light on the baby to shock its nervous system when it comes out. We don't, we can do very dim lights. 
And then if you know that you're, you know, you're healthy, do you want them to, you know, put antibiotics in your baby's eyes right off the, you know, right after childbirth? I mean, if you're not, don't have chlamydia, there's no reason technically for the antibiotics that are being used in baby's eyes. And so you can advocate to refuse that, but, you know, just like, okay, if you, if there's question, just test me the week before I'm due or something, you know, just do an extra test. And if the insurance won't cover it, cover it yourself, you know, just so that you don't have to do unnecessary things for the baby either when it's born. And, and once the baby's born skin to skin, right on you, it's the best thing. So the baby can start suckling right away and breastfeed feeding. Oh my gosh, Adrian, I could do a whole lecture on this. Cause let me tell you after two weeks of hell, it's really, really good and good experience, <laughs> but <laughs> it's I've really important. So much research about, about breastfeeding. I had a friend who, a close friend who said, I think offhand a couple of months before she was about to have her first baby that she wasn't uh, planning to breastfeed. And I kind of went white. I mean, I was like, wait, what, you know, not cause she had a complication, but just, you know, it's a preferential thing. And I said, before you make that decision, let me send you every piece of research that I've covered for well Cause we do these research wrap ups. Like uh, we used to do them monthly, but they're quarterly now. And I probably sent her, I don't know, maybe 30 studies, you know, by email. And I said, you know, you don't have to go through every single one, just read the, the abstracts or the results or the whatever, but just do read this before you make that decision. And she ended up doing that and breastfeeding for over six months and, and saying she really enjoyed the experience and helped her lose weight and bond with her child. And she changed her mind basically. But yes, I, I know oh we can talk about it for hours, yes. how powerful breastfeeding it's, is. And again, that oxytocin connection. And two, like, I didn't know about this with men, but the nipple shields, nipple shields are amazing. Actually, it was just in Mind Body Green. I uh, was interviewed for an article on nipple shields. I mean, let me tell you, I wish I knew about that because that is game changing. It can be so helpful, but that skin to skin, that oxytocin, that bonding, and then, of course, the fetal development, brain development, likely to have addictions or addictive disorders, things like that. So there's so many, so many benefits. And with that said, again, detoxing our body as healthy as we can, keeping out chemicals, et cetera, it's important. But there's no, no formula that imitates breast milk. There is not one. So yeah, I'm with you on that one. And not to make anyone feel bad if they don't or couldn't, but to, you know, try you know, definitely to try because also getting a better night's sleep with breastfeeding. I mean, it's just huge. I mean, I know when my first one, cause I was work, I went back to work at three weeks. I was an OBGYN resident. So when uh, Amanda was born, my firstborn, you know, I breastfed her and pumped at, you know, pumped at the hospital every day. And, you know, so she'd have bottles while I was away. And then I would try to breastfeed, but I only was able to breastfeed her for three months doing that. Just the milk supply and stress of being an OBGYN resident certainly played in, but then having to switch and make bottles in the middle of the night, already sleep deprived. Yeah. Yeah. So baby two, <laughs> the uh, Mira, I breastfed her for close to a year. So I was like, I'm just going to keep breastfeeding you because I know bottles are just not my cup of tea. So when you have to, yeah. But if you can, it's, it's a gift to both uh, mother and baby, not just for the short term, but for decades. You said bottles in the middle of the night, meaning just making a bottle was actually more work than breastfeeding. That's amazing. Oh, for I, sure. I didn't oh, know that. Absolutely. The temperature, checking it, actually having to get out of bed versus roll over and grab the baby out of, out of the bassinet and roll back over. You know, I mean, yeah, it's wow. so much easier, so much easier. Interesting. Wow. I didn't know that. Okay. That's great to know. Of course, this is very selfish um, in that I'm taking lots of personal notes, but hopefully for everybody <laughs> else as well. I'm so glad you mentioned the antibiotics in the, the child's eyes, because this is something I knew nothing about um, and just learned about from my doula about two weeks ago. And then, you know, other things like the vitamin K injections or certain, you know, standard of care procedures that you know, might not be necessary. Like you said, if you don't have chlamydia, there's, you know, no reason to do it. So what would you, are there any other, you know, standard of care practices in the birthing and post-delivery period that you think aren't necessarily medically necessary or that people can ask about or, or potentially avoid? And which ones do you think are really important? 
Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And a lot of the reason that we have these standards of care is so that people aren't lost to follow up, right? Why things are done in the hospital, because they may not follow back up with their pediatrician or, you know, their OBGYN afterwards, right? Uh, I thought you were, I thought you were going to say are for liability. <laughs> more yeah, than Yeah, and then and that too, that, that probably, but, you know, again, you know, it's a very natural process. It doesn't need to be Um, industrialized in the way it has been. And I mean, I've seen colleagues who immediately put an epidural, like the woman's not even having painful cramps, but the anesthesiologist there, let's just go ahead and put the epidural in now. And then you've got a Pitocin the heck out of that mama, which high dose Pitocin can have negative consequences. I believe the early, we're seeing preliminary research on this, which we didn't believe it, it could, but it could um, be one of those layers that can cause some maybe neurologic problem further down or autism association because of oc- pitocin is oxytocin. So, you know, oxytocin um, resistance possibly later on. There's some research out of the University of Washington that has looked at this parallel between high dose pitocin and autism. And I think it, it just makes sense. So we don't want to do those things if we don't have to, but I know colleagues that it's just standard process because we feel safe with the process that we're doing. And if not, you know, labels not progressing, we have a safe C-section to do. But let me tell you, then you're committed to C-sections after that. And it's women too. Like I know I was over you know, my due date and you get over that due date and you're like, oh, come on now, let's get this baby out. Like doing everything, you know, strip my membranes, which we put our finger in around the cervix and the the membranes and kind of strip it to get, to release some prostaglandins to start the contractions and stuff like that. Oh, believe me, did all that stuff. But, you know, just to induce your own natural hormones to start you in labor. So there's some fun things that we can do there. Don't drink castor oil so that don't do that. That's one that's still out there. Don't do that because you can have a meconium baby and you don't want the baby to have a bowel movement. So just, you know, be very conscientious about that. Don't rush your due date. Don't rush your due date. Let labor, as long as you're healthy, baby's healthy and heart rate variability, your OB will listen, monitor you over your due date. So like women get impatient. We want the scheduled induction, know when the baby is coming because family is coming into town. And honestly, then, you know, you know, that doesn't really fall into nature's plan. And so we may be doing things unnecessarily that maybe aren't without consequence. So I really want, you know, people to think about that too, as an OB, I think it's, those are the challenges between the art of medicine and the science of medicine. Yes, I, I agree with all of that. And it's so good to hear because of course I'm thinking I want to rush my, you know, anything over my due date. I'm like, get this baby out already. I feel that way. And it's, you know, 11, <laughs> I, 11 hear you. I hear you. You mentioned something that I just wanted to ask you. I, we're almost out of time, but I've just got a handful more questions. If somebody does end up needing a C-section or has an epidural or something happens and the baby ends up being in the NICU for a long time, you know, what are, what are the health impacts of that and and what can women do to naturally support recovery from that both you know mother and baby when things don't necessarily go as planned um, especially with microbiome support yeah yeah now there's the the whole thing about vaginal swabbing like you know for a c-section is to actually take vaginal microbiome and swab the baby with that and there's mixed research on that i mean it is you know baby would be coming out that way so i don't see that there's a negative to it so I, I mean, I really don't see there's a negative to it. We used to be so sterile and swabbing out the vagina and we don't have to do any of that. In fact, the, it's better not to for the baby because the baby is seeded with already it seeds healthy bacteria to support their immune system. And we know that now based on research. So yeah, clean external environment, but not to swab out the vagina, that microbiome that the baby passes through that gets into their nasal passageways, mucous membrane is essential for their immune system, their development. So again, healthy mom, healthy baby. And so with the C-section, you can ask for a vaginal, like a, a vaginal swab to be rubbed over the baby nose, mouth. Again, that's the way that 
nature intended it, right? So don't get grossed out by it. That is nature. There's going to be a lot of grosser things with children. Let me tell you. So um, changing diapers. It's not nearly as um, available as I think it should be, which is sad. I, I was going to deliver at a very academically esteemed university hospital, which I will not name and ended up switching because of a couple of different things I didn't like about it. But, um, one of the things I asked about were these vaginal swabs, should something happen? I need a C-section and they hardly knew about it. I mean, they were sort of like, huh, you've heard of that. And then that was it. Like it wasn't available. And that's like where we can on our own, you know, but you know, do that ourselves for our baby too. So that's definitely, again, taking what we, what intuitively, if you feel like that's going to help you and your baby, you know, intuitively the science is, you know, you have mixed results, but nature intended the baby to pass through the vagina. So, and then again, the seeding of the microbiome into the nasal passageways is associated with a more robust immune system. And again, you know, like delaying, especially with C-section, consider, you know, spacing out um, vaccinations after the fact, you know, because you want the baby's immune system to develop strongly. And, you know, like at two weeks, does a baby need a hepatitis vaccine? I mean, that's a whole nother topic of conversation, but I know for me, for another hour about, yeah, as a mom, I just did, you know, when I, the more I knew, I just paced out the vaccination schedule. And I just paid, like I paid the extra visits to pace it out, you know, with, with what we needed to do, you know, that's just the way, that's just the way it is, you know, and it's my choice to do this for my child and I'm my child's best advocate. Right. And so I think that's a really important piece that you need to understand. The second part about with a C-section, even while you've had a C-section, they can, as long as the baby's doing good, you know, they can give you the baby right there while we're sewing you up. And I've done that for mom that I've wanted to. And some are like, okay, I'm just too overwhelmed by this entire process. But others were like, you know, mom, dad in the room, baby on mom's chest, ready to breastfeed and feed while I'm sewing up. So, so that can be done too. And again, you know, we can, you know, do that with, um, without all the bright lights and noise and, and stuff that's happening. And so um, feeling, you know, that there's more that needs to be done in our training as, certainly in our, in our academic hospitals to allow more of a natural um, experience to giving birth, even in the most emergent situations. So that, you know, it's an emergency, we have to do the C-section, but I can still, the baby's good, and mom's good. At that assessment, I can give baby to mom right away. So the yeah. sooner we can do that, the better for the mom, better for the baby. And just to see the latching on, you know, this alert, awesome child latching on to mama, you know, right away. And then also again, with the epidural, you can get, do a lighter walking epidural. Some hospitals do the walking epidural. So they're not as intense for you and baby and, you know, they can increase it as you need it. So something, something to consider there as well. Absolutely. You've given me so many good tips of things to ask my midwife about. Um, and then just the last question on birthing, you know, postpartum recovery. I, I can't believe how many things I've read about postpartum depression or different infections coming up when things aren't healing properly or people, you know, not, or, or, or breastfeeding being painful and not knowing that there's a fungal connection and, and things like that. Like there's just so little information and help to help the mother's body. Um, once they go home, it's all about, you know, keeping the baby alive. So what are, you know, just a couple of the critical things that you tell women when they head home to make sure they recover properly? Yeah, definitely like this, you know, post vaginal delivery, the sits baths, like just having that warm water to like sit in the bath and, or, you know, in the toilet, they can put these little tubs. You can sit in that and just naturally, so you don't have to wipe. Oh my gosh, it can be so tender. And my first labor lasted a, lasted a day and a half. So I was like torn up. Right. And so the hat just was eye opening for me. So having that sit bath and you can put tea bags in there, the tannic acid in tea, 
can help the healing a little bit more. And so that can be very soothing. Use aloe, use coconut oil, and just keep, you know, don't use like even a dry toilet paper can be painful. So put coconut oil on that toilet paper, you know, blot dry and then six pads. When some, I, you know, I created a, a, jul- a, a bulbar cream to help women. I wouldn't do it, you know, right while you're breastfeeding because there's DHEA in there, but to help restore that tissue and, and the integrity of that tissue, use Jolva cream. And that can be uh, very beneficial along with your pelvic floor exercises, but, you know, really taking care of of the pelvic floor so that it heals, it heals well and properly is, is, you know, it will make your life so much better. And that's also with hemorrhoids, you can use Jolva around your um, anus to, especially if you have any hemorrhoids or fissures, I mean, a lot of, a lot of changes that can happen there. We want to restore that and get up your vitamin D Get that good night's sleep as much as possible. Bioidentical progesterone, if you're experiencing postpartum depression or postpartum blues, bioidentical progesterone is better than any antidepressant, as is a good night's sleep. And, you know, get the help you need. Don't, you know, don't have to do everything on your own. Not, no martyrdom being a mom. I mean, cultures in France, they have someone assist you for months in Holland they have someone come to your home for months to assist you. Maybe do a deal with another, like another mom or young, you know, someone in the neighborhood, you know, a lovely teenager or college student that can come help do the things that you don't have to do. So you can just focus on being with your baby during that time and recovering your body, your mind, your spirit, getting sleep, sleeping when they sleep. And um, one thing that I'll tell you too, Adrian, because, you know, we're, we're working women, we're strong, powerful women. And it's one thing I always would tell my patients is you will never regret the time that you choose to stay home with your child. You will never regret that decision. There's not one time. And, uh, you know, for me, I was back to work at three weeks with number one, number two, you know, I mean, just crazy. And uh, number three, you know, would go to work with me. So, you know, in my private practice, and it wasn't until my youngest now was eight years old that actually took the time. I took time off. I took the sabbatical and just changed my life around. So it was what I needed and was what they needed. And I, and I said to myself, okay, tell your patients you'll never get the time you take off to raise your children. You know, this is the time I needed to do that as a single mom now in my life. And it's, it's just been game changing, totally pivoted my career, my life, and have been able to, um, you know, help so many others that I couldn't have done in my one-to-one private practice. Absolutely. And I just love how it took you realizing that you needed to give yourself and your children more of your time that helped you to pivot into a career space that has helped you reach so many more people and arguably would make you more busy, right? You said you had four children, right? Mm -hmm. Four children, all the books you've written, all the social media presence and, and all the amazing free content on your website and everything you do and your programs and your products. It's really incredible. And the fact that it all comes from you needing to change things up to give yourself and your children more time is just, that's so perfect to me. It's like, uh, it's like it was meant to be because you figured out how to do that. And a lot of people can't. Um, It's trusting your intuition. What's the one next right step? It's hard. I mean, like being a single mom is hardest job I've ever had. So it's like, what's the one next right step? And then also thinking, you know, I got, you know, what's, what's right for me at this time, what's right for me and my family and not be, allow myself to be pulled in a a thousand different directions. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. Um, Okay. Well, I think we do have to wrap up. I have to let you go. Like I said, I could probably spend a whole nother hour with you on breastfeeding and vaccines and, you know, all these things. Oh my gosh. Uh, Yes. So maybe we'll have to have you back on the show. We don't do a lot of repeat guests, but this one, I would absolutely make an exception. So one last question I have for you before we wrap up because of your focus on it. And I think that it's helpful. It was mentioned briefly, but early menopause, uh, this is something that you sort of, you know, the sort of end of the fertility uh, period of your life and people, I think the average is 52 years old or 51 years old, right? In the US for women. 
yeah. with some people it's happening in their late thirties, like it happened to you. And since you were able to successfully reverse it for anybody that's listening, that's gone through that or knows someone who's gone through that or fears they might go through that because their mother did. What are the, first of all, root causes of it? And what can people do to make sure that that doesn't happen to them? Or if it's happening to them, how to, you know, really reverse it? Yeah, there are so many things that we can talk about. Really, it comes back to, you know, getting to produce your own hormones as naturally as possible. And that comes with progesterone, the mother hormone. So everything we can do to manage stress is going to improve our hormones. Now, there are different reasons for premature ovarian failure, early menopause, but most of the time, most, and it can be autoimmune disease, it can be genetics, but that's like the this very small percentage. The majority it's toxins, it's stress, it's hormone disruptors. And when we clear that up, we detox, like I talk about in my book, The Hormone Fix, because I go through the different, you know, different things that can really affect our body's own natural hormone production. And we want to keep our master hormones really, really strong and healthy. And the way, you know, the way we do that is, is supporting you know, definitely supporting the things that bring us pleasure in our life. Oxytocin is the most alkalinizing hormone in our body, whereas cortisol is the most acidifying hormone in our body. So as we can empower oxytocin through, you know, pleasure, orgasm, intimacy, laughter, giving joy, doing things we enjoy with people we enjoy doing them with, we increase oxytocin and decrease cortisol in our life that empowers our progesterone, our estrogen, our testosterone, our DHEA, all our reproductive hormones. And so that's the shift that has to happen. And removing these toxic hormone disruptors and cleaning up our body from that way. And it's a constant process. We're constantly exposed to toxins. So there's a way we can test. And I go have a whole testing chapter. There's a way you can test your body for these things. How optimized am I? And of course, you know, that's important at any stage of our in our life. It's, I think it's very, very important pre-pregnancy. But at any stage of our life, you know, to decrease our risk of any inflammatory conditions like cancer, heart disease, dementia, osteoporosis that we're faced with as we age. So meditation, doing things you love and enjoy, getting a good night's sleep, you know, doing things that bring you joy, that make you happy are, again, I can't say enough about that because there's no, there's no substitute for oxytocin. There's no substitute that we can do in it. And certainly I can prescribe it for a short term, but we have ability no matter what to make it naturally. And, um, and that's going to be, go a tremendous way to healing all our other hormones because it's downstream benefits. I love that. You're making me want to look up all the things that, you know, increase oxytocin that I can do in the next couple of weeks. Um, I have a chapter in my book on that too. So I was just about to say, I can't wait for you to send it because I'm going to, I actually haven't really read that much as far as pregnancy books and stuff, because there's just so much out there. And I think it's been overwhelming to think about uh, which one to read and which one to read first, but I'm going to read yours first because uh, I always like to look at it from sort of the science medicine, you know, biology side of side of things. Um, it's so, definitely like as far as, you know, the, a classic is what to expect when you're expecting. I mean, that is definitely a classic, easy, quick read and, you know, what to expect the first year. That's some of my favorite. Another good pregnancy book is written by Joel Evans. He's an integrative OBGYN in New York City. So that would be another one. One last thing about menopause. You mentioned bioidentical hormones. So you do give those to patients. I, you know, is that considered natural or unnatural? Or Bioidentical rather- hormones are natural, but we're supplementing with something natural. We supplement with food, which is natural. So, and we used to eat nose to tail and that way we'd be getting animal hormones to supplement our hormones, right? So I consider bioidentical hormones post-menopause essential. I consider it essential. So bioidentical progesterone, and I created a cream called Balance, which has progesterone and pregnenolone, these two mother hormones, game-changing, really beneficial. And, you know, of course I put DHEA and Jolva. So I believe in using these bioidenticals and certainly estrogen. So the, we balance this out a little bit goes a long way. We don't need to have the hormones of a 20 year old, but we need to have, you know, healthy, balanced, even keel 
hormones because we're not living in nature. We're not eating nose to tail on a regular basis. We're not drinking from streams with minerals and eating fresh food recently picked or killed, right? So that that's a different energy than how we were designed in the last couple hundred years. We've really changed the way we live. So unless we're living that way, I feel very strongly to optimize our, our quality of life and our longevity the bioidentical hormones are one of the keys. Got it. Okay. I'm so glad you explained that because I have gotten a couple of questions from women who are in menopause. If I had information on whether bioidentical hormones were really, you know, natural, or uh, if they were trying to do things naturally in menopause, should they take those? And of course, I don't know. Usually when I don't know something, I have a lot of research and I've, you know, interviewed enough experts to pass along what I've learned from them. Um, But I, you know, really had no answer. So I'm glad now I, now I have a little bit more information on that. Anna, this has been so rich with helpful information, both for me and I hope so many women listening and men who may be supporting a woman in their life, trying to get pregnant, being pregnant, birthing, breastfeeding, going through menopause, et cetera. Please tell us where you know people can find you for more information and, and certainly where to, to grab your book. Yeah, definitely easy to find me at dranna.com, A-N-N-A.com. And that's my website. And there's a whole bunch of free information and, you know, lots of education there and recipes and good stuff. And my books are on everywhere books are sold. So support your local bookstore and get the hormone fix and my second book, Keto Green 16 for social media at the girlfriend doctor on Instagram and Facebook. And we also have a Keto Green community on Facebook as well. Thank you again. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you.